Um, hello, good evening everyone, uh, and welcome to our very first CIDER webinar. Um, tonight we'll be transporting you to beautiful orchards or uh, across four very different parts of the world. We're talking New Zealand, the United States, England and Sweden. Hi everyone. <laughs> Um, so our panel of artisan cider makers are here to demonstrate that their craft ciders made from 100% fruit and not concentrate have com the complexity, quality and elegance to qualify as wine. First off, I'd like to introduce you to our host this evening, the notorious Oz Clark OBE, a man who's considered to be one of the leading authorities in all things wine and as cider is wine, um, I'm sure he knows his fermented apples too. Um, so he's got, he's, uh, we'll be guiding you through tonight's session with our five guests who I'm going to introduce in tasting order. First off, actually before, doesn't have a cider, but um, we've got Alistair Morell, uh, who is the man behind what is Cider is Wine, and he'll be explaining that a little bit more. But he's really the person who, well, the glue really that brings these incredible producers together here this evening. We've got uh, Mark McGill. Hi, Mark. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello, from New Zealand. Well, that, you took my words out of my mouth. Mark's from New Zealand, from Abel Cider, uh, and his, his cider is the uh, Abel Method 2017. We have uh, Eleanor, thanks, thanks, Mark. <laughs> We've got Eleanor Legger here from uh, Eden Cider. Hi, Eleanor. Uh, yeah. And she's based in Vermont in the US, and her cider is the Siren Song 2019 which is she going to be dancing over the screen as well as Mark? Or is it? <laughs> uh, there she does as well. Uh, we've got Simon Day. Uh, Simon's, Simon's from uh, Once Upon a Tree in Hereford, pretty close to most of us here in the UK. Um, and uh, his is the Bacchus Co-Fermented 2018. Thanks for the demonstration, Simon. And finally, we have uh, Andreas Sundgren uh, from Brandland in Sweden. Uh, his his uh, wine is the Claim Ice, Ice Cider 2017. So a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, this is a live seminar, so if you have any questions for Oz or our guests, um, please, or even if you have any sort of tasting notes that you want to share or food pairing suggestions for any of the ciders we're tasting today, please let us know from the chat box. It's down there if you haven't chatted there already. Um, be careful to uh, make sure that you're responding to um, panelists and attendees. You can do a little drop down. You could have got a click to do a little drop down part because that way you're talking to everybody, uh, not just panelists, because no one else will see it. Um, and we'll do. We'll be doing a little Q and A session at the end with with Oz and all of the guests. So make sure you do ask your questions in there. Um, and we're going to be running a poll towards the end. So please get involved and let us know which is your favourite cider. Um, so that's enough from me. Uh, I'm going to hand you over to Oz and our wonderful guests and um, enjoy. <laughs> Ciao. Thanks, Richard. Well, I think the first thing uh, I should do is say uh, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night, basically, um, to everybody. Um, uh, and also introduce Alistair, because Alistair's the guy who has put this whole concept together. And, and Alistair, do you want to just... Um, take us through um, how Cider is Wine um, came to be and, and what you think it means. Thanks, Oz. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, oh, wait, Alistair, one thing. Everyone should pour themselves a glass of, wine, uh, of cider yeah. now. I'm going to pour it off Get stuck in wine. now. Abel's going to be our first cider, so if you want to start there, that's fantastic. Cider is Wine, question or statement? or both. Before I answer that, I need to delve into a bit of history. It's an honor to have Oz Clark here talking about these ciders tonight, but it's been a bit of a journey. I first became aware of Oz Clark um, when my father bought me a book, a signed one, The Wine Fact Finder. Yeah, it's true, the late 1980s, he gave me that book. That was just when I was starting out in the wine industry. A time when an Australian bottle of wine meant you put three holes in the top and you shake it on your chips, as the old Monty Python saying said. So I've been in the wine industry for a long time, most of my working life. 
And it was only when I started working with a Swedish cidery um, and I tasted their ciders that I had to take a step back. That cidery was Brandland. And I had to question everything that I once knew or thought I knew. When I did my wine exams 35 years ago, wine was held up as the only alcoholic drink that you could actually make from its exclusively from its own fruit. Tasting this cider from Brandland made me say, wow, how can this be so delicious and so, well, wine-like? I had to go deeper. The Cambridge English Dictionary or a definition of wine is any alcoholic drink that's made from fruit or flowers. But cider is wine means much more than that. It's about an appreciation of cider, about an appreciation of cider as much as wine. It's not about making cider into wine or wine into cider. The EU definition of wine is an alcoholic drink that partially or wholly fermented from freshly gathered grapes and that is what we expect to buy from the supermarket or wine shop or online. Not so with cider. Cider is the wild west when it comes to what makes it. Every country has its own version of what cider is, how it's made and what goes into it. In this country you need just 35% juice, all of which can be imported and from concentrate. So yes, you can import concentrate from China or the United States or wherever in the world, reconstitute it in the UK. Hey ho, you've got a British cider. That's how it's three for five quid on supermarket shelves. In Sweden, it's 15%. In Spain, it's 100%. In Portugal, it's 0%. In Australia, it's 0%. And New Zealand. In the US, I think it's 50%. Eleanor will correct me, I've, I've no doubt. But um, <clears throat> nonetheless, this is a time when, when we're talking about food and drink, we want to know where our foods come from, where, what's made it, who's made it, how does it go to be such a fantastic product? In the UK, we have a fantastic, unrivaled cider making history. And yet, it seems crazy that we don't celebrate or define what the real deal is. Ciders made from 100% juice, not from concentrate. Made just like wine. The great unknown about these 100% juice, not from concentrate, Ciders, Perry's and fruit wines, because we work with all of them, um, is that they're representative of what the French call terroir. That is where they come from, who made them, the varieties themselves, how they're made and aged. The diversity of styles and flavours is every bit as wide as wine, if not wider. So tonight we're going to take you through four of those ciders. Oz is going to take you through four of those ciders with four, in our opinion, of the best 100% juice cider makers on the planet, representative of their terroir. Each is unique in its own way. And all cider is wine ciders start in the orchard. Like a grape wine, they ask a, cider, a, a maker, what makes a great cider or wine? It's the fruit that they start with. So I say again, cider is wine, question or statement. One that I'll leave you to consider and ponder for yourselves during the course of this evening. And we can discuss it in the Q&A at the end. Oz, what's your experience of cider? Well, um, you don't want all my experiences of cider, Alistair. <laughs> no. uh, uh, you certainly don't want to hear too much about Bill Notley's Scrumpy, which he sold by the pail. Um, you had to bring your own pail to the farmyard door uh, when we were kids, uh, and it was about one and sixpence or two bob a pail. You don't want to hear about that. No. Uh, um, but can I just, um, I wrote a couple of things down here about cider is wine. Let me just, they, they absolutely back up what you say. Should I just read them out? I said, so let's get this straight. One, I pick the fruit. Grapes for wine, apples for cider. Two, I crush the fruit. And three, I ferment the juice. Grape juice for wine, apple juice for cider. So it's I'm, there's nothing different yet. I've, and I ferment it either with wild local yeasts or with cultured yeasts, exactly the same. Then I sell it with bubbles or without. What have I done? 
What's the difference between wine and cider so far? Nothing. Flavour, yes. Thank goodness, because you know, there's quite enough wine in the world. Philosophy, no. Pure, properly grown, grown fruit transformed into a delicious alcoholic drink by the simplest methods available. Real wine, real cider. Cider is wine. Well, put like that, it sounds like that. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, how long have humans been making cider? Um, apples, they probably come from Kazakhstan thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, it, anyway, they've, they've been around for an awful long time. Um, and frankly, people have been making cider, I would have thought, as long as they've been growing apple trees. Now, apple trees, the apples drop off the tree when they're ripe. They get bruised. They start fermenting. And that's why windfalls in an orchard to this day smell so pungent. They're fermenting. And the pigs in an orchard, ask anybody who leaves their pigs in the orchard, the uh, pigs in an orchard know that. They snaffle and munch them down and they get drunk. Animals have been getting drunk on fermenting fruit since before the humans were around. So what marks humans out as a superior species is their ability to put two and two together. And when it comes to drink, to say, those pigs look happy. How could we cash in on that? Well, the Greeks and the Romans and the Celts, they all made alcoholic drinks from apples. They made beer too, but it's much more complicated to make beer than cider. With cider, if you can squeeze the juice out of the apples and let it be, it'll ferment into some kind of cider. Simple. That's what they did with grapes in the warm south and in the cold north, they used apples. So from our point of view in England, and in Britain rather, um, William the Conqueror's arrival from Normandy in 1066 greatly increased the interests in apples and in orchards and in cider. And in, by 1204, 800 years ago, we're finding the first named variety of apple, the pear main. In 2021, Pear mains are still going. No one can give me the name of a grape variety still going from 1204. Now, apple varieties mutate even faster than grape varieties do. So by now, experts reckon there may be 60,000 different varieties of apple all over the place. Now, there may be more, but there won't be less and potentially that means 60,000 different flavors. Although, as we all know, uh, the, a lot of those uh, apples won't have any particular flavors, just like most grape varieties don't have any particular flavor, but that's a lot of apples. And this evolution, for those of you who, who, who haven't really picked up on the different um, varieties of apples and, and the species, this evolution has, has created a big divide between so-called dessert or culinary apples and cider varieties. And it's a really important difference because you can make very good cider out of eating apples. Coxes, russets, sturmers, bramleys, you know, they all make attractive, gentle, fruity ciders with lots of flavor. But you can't eat a cider apple and expect to keep your teeth. And, and the reason is it's in the skins, and it's in the flesh. Firstly, there are two main classes of cider apples, bitter sweet and bitter sharp. Now that bitter is fundamental. It's the amount of bitter tannin in the skins. All good cider apples have got enough tannin in the skin to make it really harsh if you get it into your mouth. And frankly, the best cider apple skin, you can hardly chew it. But just as in red wine, that tannin is massively important in the structure of the cider 
uh, of the wine, so it is in cider. And that's to do with it being an antioxidant, to do with being a clarifying agent, and to do with it being antibacterial, and to do with it allowing the cider to age beautifully and change with age. And, and that flesh, well, bitter sweets will have more sugar, bitter sharps will have more acid. Both of them have got lots of tannin. But all the cider varieties will have flesh packed with cellulose. Now, when you chew the flesh, it becomes like a sodden ball of cotton wool in your mouth. It's no good for eating. It is perfect for cider because you crush and press an eating apple and you create a possibly delicious but gooey, mushy mess that you then try to turn into a fermentable liquid. You crush and press a cider apple and all the juice is squeezed out of that chewy flesh, leaving just the cellulose, the pips and the skin behind. All the juice is out there making cider. Now, I think this uh, idea of Alastair's of cider is wine is, is brilliant because, of course, in Britain, 400 years ago, cider was wine in Britain. Sparkling cider was called the English champagne and served at court. And the champagne makers. Now, this, this, is, this makes me feel, feel, feel good. The champagne makers got the idea of how to make wine sparkle, how to make wine sparkle by creating a second fermentation in the bottle. They got the idea from the cider makers of Hereford, Gloucester and Somerset. They'd been doing it for generations before... Dom Perignon supposedly started doing it at the beginning of the 18th century. And it looks as though Alistair's five-year-old has drawn a complex series of, uh, of, of pictures there showing how you do it. Well, I tell you what it, it means. Um, to make a wine sparkle by the by the the uh, the so-called traditional method. And by the way, our first wine that we've got tonight, the Abel. Uh, from New Zealand is made by this traditional method and Mark will tell you more about it in a moment but it basically means that you make the wine ferment uh, or the cider ferment for a second time in a bottle by adding a bit of yeast and a bit of sugar now you then bang a cork into the bottle um, and the fermentation happens underneath uh, enormous pressure creating alcohol and creating carbon dioxide uh, the carbon dioxide normally would would all go off into the air it can't um, because you've got a cork stuck stuck in the top of the bottle um, and luckily carbon dioxide is a very soluble gas it's about 20 times more soluble than nitrogen for instance so all of that carbon dioxide dissolves in the wine and that's what is called the traditional method a second fermentation inside the bottle but that was impossible to do and, uh, before the 17th century, because basically <laughs> it's King James I of England. God bless him. Um, we were running out of trees in England um, uh, because we were using all our trees for smelting furnaces and things. And King James said, you've got to stop using trees for fuel for your furnaces, not allowed to, from 1615 onwards. The point was that he was making more money from selling trees to the Navy so they could make ships and presumably go and fight wars with France. So he said, no one is allowed to use trees chopped down for furnaces. Well, luckily, Britain has got this other dirty, mucky black stuff called coal. Now, in the northeast of England, they've got coal. They've also got coal in the Forest of Dean, right on the River Severn. And the, the Forest of Dean is right over the River Severn from the fruit apple orchards of Gloucestershire. And so what happens with coal is it, 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 um, uh, it burns far, far hotter than wood. And so consequently, you can make glass far, far stronger than, uh, than uh, a wood fire. By chance, it's also very impure, so that the glass is much blacker, which is great because it protects whatever's inside it from, from uh, sunlight. 
if you've got a strong bottle, it means that this second fermentation inside the bottle won't blow the bottle up. In France, you try to do that with their lovely, delicate wood-fired glass, and the bottles all blow up all the time. Another crucial thing, Portugal and England had always been good friends since the Treaty of Windsor in 1272 or something. So Portugal was the place where they made cork. Now, we had always kept the knowledge of cork as a stopper. France didn't have that knowledge. They weren't friendly with Portugal. They used all kinds of things like lumps of wood, rags wrapped in olive oil, God knows what, to shove in the top of their bottles uh, and couldn't keep a seal. So we had a, we had a strong bottle. We had a cork which kept a seal like that. And it meant that if you put something to re-ferment in that bottle, you could then tie it down with a bit of twine, leave it for two or three years, and all of this second fermentation would create wonderful bubbles, but also wonderful extra flavors. And so that's a bit of a digression, but it's a terribly important um, point because it shows that 400 years ago, cider from the West of England was absolutely regarded as the best kind of drink that the court of St. James in London could possibly want. So I think we should uh, bring in Mark here uh, because Mark is now making a modern version of that uh, in the, the, I would say the Sylvan paradise of Nelson in, in uh, the South Island of New Zealand. Now, Nelson is a, is a, is a genuinely gorgeous bucolic place. Um, it produces nearly 60% of all New Zealand cider. Um, it's the area, it's the famous, the, the most famous uh, apple area. If you, uh, and I'm sure many of you have uh, eaten New Zealand Brabans, uh, the Braben was raised um, in the Upper Mutari area, which is bang in the middle of Nelson. And of course the Upper Mutari area is also exactly where um, Able Cider is based. Uh, the New Zealand Cider Festival uh, um, uh, happens in, 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 in Nelson. By the way, Captain Cook carried cider on his ships to combat scurvy amongst the sailors. Now, I wonder, did he carry seedlings with him as well? Did he carry the odd cider tree somewhere down in the hold? Did New Zealand get a very early look in at some beautiful apple trees from Gloucester and Worcestershire and Herefordshire, I wonder. But Mark, welcome uh, from the, the breakfast time glories of, uh, of, of Nelson. Uh, and Thank you, Oz. Tell us a little bit about, about Nelson and tell us about how on earth you got involved in making what is in effect a, a champagne method, a traditional method cider. Well, yeah, I guess, uh, first of all, thanks for everyone coming and um, uh, it's great to great to talk about such a, uh, a novel subject, uh, cider as wine. So, I mean, for us, we started making cider mainly because um, my wife, who's, who's from a well-known wine family, she didn't really uh, like drinking beer and so she started drinking cider and... Um, say the name, say the name. <laughs> Sophie, Sophie Healy, so James Healy is uh, her father, um, ex-Cloudy Bay uh, winemaker and winemaker of the Dog Point. Um, if you want to try, there's plenty of that in the UK if you want to try it. Um, and yeah, so we, we tried some ciders and we found that they just didn't actually taste like the fruit they were supposedly made from. Um, they were sweet and watery and thin. Um, and so we thought, well, me being a winemaker and us having a wine background, why not have a crack at, at making a cider that, that's going to taste like a wine and, and taste like the fruit and be dry um, because that's what we prefer, a dry cider um, and a dry wine. So that's what we did and that's what we set out to, to do. And being purists, I guess, um, I'm one to, to, to kind of follow these techniques and, and, and make sure that what I make is, is true to type and, and doing the bottle fermentation a la as it were, champagne, but actually cider, as Oz has pointed out, um, was the only way, in my view, to um, deliver our, our cider as we like it, uh, with a fine, delicate bubble, which didn't take away from the aromas and flavors of, of uh, apples and pears, uh, which have delicate flavors, depending on, again, which varieties you use. Do you have any role models? Any role models yeah. um, in cider? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess, yeah. And, and, 
Well, obviously James Healy's, uh, but he, he's a, he's a great role mo- role model. Um, my my life has been spent in the wine game, but um, actually as a as an agent for a French oak cooperage, so I've I've visited every winery in Australia, and New Zealand for twenty years. Um, so there's probably lots of role models out there. As far as the, cider goes, were there actual flavours that you'd come across before? I'm just thinking it's it's uh, serendipitous this, but the guy who used to be the boss at Cloudy Bay uh, used to make his own cider out of out of like in in his garage, and that was the first yeah. time I tasted a really good um, uh, uh, New Zealand cider, and he made it by the traditional method. I don't think you sold yes. it. I drank it. That all. was that was Ian Morden, if I'm if right. I'm correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a more recent boss um, after James left. So, yeah, yeah. Indeed, he was. Yeah, yeah. But from a cider point of view, I guess um, going international. I mean, I have um, been fortunate enough to visit uh, Eric Bordelay and um, and uh, also uh, a guy um, called another Andreas Andreas Schneider. Um, from Germany, who makes Schneider's ciders. Yeah. Um, those two guys have been pretty. Um, yeah, they, it was great to meet them and um, and uh, get some tips, I suppose. Because is there a, a a cider tradition in New Zealand? No, there's not. No, I mean um, Herman Seifried, who came here in the early days from Germany. Um, he he did start making cider um, when he came straight to Nelson. I think um, that was his main. Uh, plan actually to come here and make cider but um other than him um there hasn't really been, been ma- anything made commercially um you know of note in the past other than the odd you know something out the back of an orchard like like probably what happened in in, in the uk too yeah because so i noticed that what's interesting about uh, about your beautiful by the way uh let's just pour it fresh so everyone can see this is the bottle uh, to make sure you're, you've got the right one in your hands. Pour yes. some fresh. Just watch that lovely bubble go up. Also, uh, watch what's really interesting and exciting to me is it, it's not completely clear. And I'm sure that Mark will explain why that is a good thing in a moment. And just have a mouthful of it. Sure. If you insist, Oz. Because that <laughs> is breakfast time for you, so you must be ready. Oh, it's great. It's a great breakfast drink. <clears throat> uh, I think that is fantastically fresh. It's wonderfully, it's wonderfully pure o- on the palate. It's dry as a bone. And yet, and, and I notice that the two cider apples that you have are the, are the, mo- are the rarer bitter sharps, not bitter sweets, which is very interesting. Was that, was that because you wanted bitter sharps or because there aren't many cider apples around Nelson yet for you to choose from? Yeah, no, it's it's, uh, it's it's certainly the latter. I mean, you know, what we can get is what we can get, and um, and until we start planting a few more varieties and actually get fruit. So, um, I mean, for us, we 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 predominantly use uh, Cox's uh, orange pippin and Sturmer pippin in the cider, um, yep. and then the other the other varieties play a, a more of a minor part. And what's interesting is you've got some pears in there as well. What what we do you do? What, uh, and they look as though they're dual purpose or they're, or they're things like Packhams, those sorts of pears. Um, although I, I, actually, I don't even know, Biscuit, Winter Nellis, Winter Coal. I mean, I've been trying to research them and it's not easy. Um, but no, uh, so those, I've, got the, the, I've got the pears there. Yeah, so the pears, Winter Nellis and Winter Coal, they're the very russeted late season pears here. And um, I guess we use pears for... Um, I like pears for aromatics, but also to uh, because they have some natural uh, un- unfermentable sugars uh, that helps to balance out the acidity of the apples. So, I mean, the dryness on this is it is very dry. It's got 0.16 grams of glucose fructose, so zero zero glucose fructose. So, um, yeah, the pear the pear for us gives gives some nice texture too. So. Of course, because that's one of the secrets in Perry's, isn't it? Uh, these unfermentable sugars just take some of the even in a bone dry a bone dry drink they just take some of the the edge off it and i i thought this may be something to do with how you make it and if you want to tell us now how you did because i even found i definitely found an aromatic sense of the skin of the apple 
uh, not just the tannins, but the actual aromatics of the skin. And I also thought I had there's that, that lovely bitterness, which isn't skin bitterness, it's pip bitterness. Now, on the whole, one was, oh, we don't want that. But I found it actually added something to the lovely, chewy freshness of this cider. Yes, and I, I think, um, I guess, just going back quickly, um, the first time we made cider, we we made it, made it like, I guess, everyone else does. And, you know, we, we hand half of the fruit, um, crushed, pressed, pressed, crushed the fruit, pressed it, and uh, fermented the juice. Um, but I kind of thought there wasn't enough flavour. And, and when I did some reading on, on apples and pears, it said all the aromas and flavours are actually in the skins. So as being a winemaker, I thought, well, why don't I just ferment the whole fruit like you do you know, a red wine, essentially, you're fermenting the full skin seeds, the whole lot. And so, so that's what we did for the next seven years, um, and did a lot of small batch trials and fermenting the whole, the whole fruit. Um, so we, we hand pick it, uh, we mill it uh, straight into open top tanks. Um, and then we ferment um, again with, as you say, cultured yeast or wild yeast. And, you um, and we just let it ferment on the full skins. We do plant, we plunge as well, just like you would uh, a red wine. And uh, so just to give it some air and, and feed the yeast a bit of oxygen um, and also help macerate, macerate it up a bit more. Um, and at the end, that's uh, showing the video there. We, we put it into a basket press and we press it off. And that's when we end up with the, the juice. Well, it's actually the wine now. It's the apple base wine um, uh, in tank. And, and so, after that, it spends uh, six to nine months in tank uh, aging. We don't need it, don't do any fining or filtration. We just let it settle uh, via gravity. And then we go uh, rack to bottle. So we put the, the clear base wine into the bottle. And that's when we add a little bit of sugar and a little bit of yeast for the bottle fermentation. Uh, hence, we call it method. Uh, method essentially means bottle fermentation. Um, and that is that is how you make able method cider or champagne cider or or as we say you know the, the the cider back in the uk where the champagne makers learnt from the uk people <laughs> <laughs> and i and the cloudiness why is the cloudiness there yeah so i guess one of the key things we do um so when we put it in bottle with the sugar and yeast and it, and it bottle ferments um it sits in bottle over a period of or well, up to 18 months um normally what, what you do when you make champagne is, is you would uh, riddle. Um, so the, the yeast in the bottle that's created from the fermentation would go into the neck of the bottle and you'd then disgorge it. So you'd take the crown seal off uh, and you take that cloudy bit out of the uh, champagne and there, therefore you get a clear, uh, a clear wine or sh champagne if you like. For us, we, just, we, we don't disgorge. We just leave that sediment, that yeast sediment in the bottle uh, and that's why there is some cloudiness. Um, and for us, that, that little bit of yeast in the bottle over time actually helps to keep uh, the cider fresh and helps to give more texture and, and flavor and complexity. And we start going into those yeasty, bready, brioche characters, mm. again, synonymous with um, champagne. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, a tremendous drink and a great one to start us off this evening or this morning. Um, and uh, so, do I, so do I, Oz, so do I. Good. <laughs> Now let's move on. Uh, let's move on to Once Upon a Tree. Uh, let me just get this one up so everyone knows if, which one it is. Uh, this one, Once Upon a Tree, Bacchus cider, and you think Bacchus cider? I thought Bacchus was a great variety. Well, maybe it is because in the smaller letters it says Wine Lees cider. Now this one uh, comes from the west of England. Hereford uh, and it's made by an old friend of mine called Simon Day and the first time I met Simon would have been at Free Choir's uh, vineyard in Gloucestershire I should think um, Simon and that that is in the village of Newent oh my god who's that no 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 it's I've still got that jacket I've still got those jeans I, I, it, as soon as the barber's open I'll still have the same hairstyle wow Dear, oh dear, but thank God I haven't got that ridiculous Dutch um, caravan any longer. That was uh, when Hugh Dennis and I visited. Now, is that the, dra the Dragon's Orchard? That is Dragon Orchard, ah, yeah. yeah. This, yeah. this is one of the great orchards in, in Herefordshire, 150 to 200 years old. 
uh, and Simon took, took me and Hugh there a few years ago. Well, look, let's just have a, a mouthful of this and then Simon, you can tell us about this rather unusual but delicious cider you've got here. Mm. Completely different in style uh, from the Abel. Um, rounder, gentler, much, um, much more sort of evidence of that a warmth of the yeast it's as and it is almost whiny in in character so um <laughs> firstly you you are you are a winemaker as well as a cider maker aren't you yeah yeah that's right so we make 16 ridges wine here um as well um, we've got vineyards all around us and here in ledbury um but side we do make more cider than we do wine in terms of volume uh and so the once upon a tree is is our cider range why did you decide to do cider? Because you were you were a successful winemaker um, before you went uh, to do Once Upon a Tree. Yeah, so, well, I'd, I'd been uh, working as a consultant, uh, putting people into vineyards and, and making wine in, in the UK uh, and other places, but mostly in the UK. Um, and I, uh, because my brother-in-law, Martin, who you, who you know, took over winemaking at Three Choirs. Um, so uh, I didn't have a gig there, um, but I'd, I, know, I'd, I'd, I basically took over from my father when he retired um, and, and uh, did consultancy for, for, for winemakers. But I was getting frustrated because I was telling people how to make cider, how, uh, sorry, how to make wine, how to grow grapes, but I wasn't getting my hands dirty. Um, and then I moved back to this part of the world where I grew up. Um, just down the road from Newant, uh, in, in just outside Ledbury, and of course, surrounded by these beautiful orchards here. And uh, that's when that little light bulb moment came to me, as I, I was walking my dog through these beautiful orchards, Dragon Orchard, we just saw a picture of. And um, as a winemaker, you were talking about how wine is made in the vineyard. And there I was passing these beautiful, stunning orchards, gorgeous fruit and I just suddenly went well why why isn't the same with with cider and I knew that the cider fruit from the from the dragon orchard was going into uh, uh into Bulmers, uh into mass production so all that fantastic fruit being concentrated down being beaten about with a big stick and all the character taken out from it so I just approached them approached the the owners Anna Norman Stania and said look I think I'd like to try something I know a little bit about wine um, you've got fantastic fruit. Is there something we can do together um, and start to make some some cider? And this was back in 2007. There was a, quite a few people making cider uh, at that point. A lot of it was farmhouse style, the more scrumpy style. Um, but I, again, you mentioned it earlier about being the wine of England uh, a few centuries ago. And if you go to the Hereford, uh, Hereford Cider Museum, you'll see these beautiful... Car um, uh, glass cut glasses that cider used to be served in you know so it was very much the drink of the aristocracy and also I think well with the wine background this beautiful fruit can we do something that is more wine style can we make a, a cider which someone would be very pleased to bring to a dinner party something that went really well with food and that's how it all started and it's evolved and, and I don't like to stay still and I like to experiment um, and I've um, I would say I've been influenced more recently with trips to the States and um, what, what I'm doing with, with a cidery over there. Uh, and that is probably, again, another light bulb moment is this combination, this co-fermentation, taking some of that also from craft beer, and what's happening there, um, and how trendy collaborations are. Well, it's kind of made sense to collaborate with myself. I've got wine here in the same building. I've got you know, grape skins. We, the first co-ferment I did was actually on Pinot Noir grape skins to make a rosé star cider with lots of beautiful Pinot Noir character coming through. Um, but this particular one, so Bacchus, as you, as you said, Oz, is, is, a, is um, a quite widely planted white wine grape in the UK. Um, and we are uh, 16 Ridges Bacchus is one of our more popular wines. Um, and I was racking um, one of the 10,000 litre tanks there of the Bacchus and when I got to the bottom and the yeast with about 200 litres of, of gross leaves in there this, this you know orangey yellow glutinous massive yeast 
and it smelt gorgeous. And I just thought, we can't just throw that away. There's got to be something we can do with that. And outside, we were pressing our Dabinette apples for our cider. And I said, All right, let's just let's pump some of that juice on top of these leaves and see what we can do with this and see if we can capture some of that character in a cider. Um, so moving on from the co ferments that we were doing with, with the skins, I thought, well, you know, perhaps we can, we can get some character and interest into it. So we did that. And uh, that was Davinette juice on the on these on the yeast leaves, uh, and it was working beautifully. Uh, and then over a period of nine months, we did lees stirring, um, so the equivalent of batonage, but in a stainless steel tank. Re um, uh, moving those yeast leaves back up through the side and letting them settle out, uh, and slowly those yeast cells breaking down and starting to do the autolysis characters that Mark was just talking about, and. and you know, synonymous with with, uh, with great flavours and sparkling wine, um, and giving this creamy texture into the cider. Um, what I decided partway through was that it needed a bit more acidity because Dabinet's quite low in acidity. Um, so uh, we we picked um, from from Dragon Orchard, which you can see on screen now. We picked uh, some dessert varieties, most of which was russet, Egremont russet, which is a beautiful apple obviously to eat but also it makes a wonderful cider really nutty um, and then I combine those that into the into the cider as well so it's a 50 50 bittersweet dabinette and dessert apple this picture is actually just shows some of the um, this is dragon orchard again um, the the trees in the foreground to the left are some of the dessert varieties they grow over 30 different varieties of uh, of, of apple in that section, mostly dessert varieties, some heritage, some new varieties. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the background, you can see the taller trees. Those are the cider trees. Um, and uh, whereas the, the dessert apples have to be picked by hand because of the, the way that the trees are grown, it's very open sort of goblet shape, which then hang down. Um, and it's all about capturing the dessert apples. You want, want the color. It's the appearance of the apple, which is important. So you're, you're trying to get those sun blushed um, uh, skins and so on, so sun exposure is important. With cider apples, sunlight's still important, but they grow into these um, you know, 15, 20 foot high Christmas tree shaped uh, trees, um, which is, that, that's, a, that's a, what we call a bush orchard, which was developed in the early 70s by Bulmers, in fact. Um, and it's quite an intensive way of growing apples. Um, and I think there's a picture later on of how we harvest those uh, by machine. So there we go. So that's a tractor mounted shaker, which goes on the machine <laughs> and shakes the, shakes the apples down. So you don't have to climb up the tree to get them down. Um, so yeah, we've got a couple of different methods of, of growing, the, growing the fruit for these ciders and of course, harvesting them. Um, and the apples do get bruised, but we're, we're crushing them pretty rapidly from, uh, from harvest through in, into um, and getting them into tank. And this just shows our press setup. So anyone that's familiar with vineyards will recognize some of the kit here. Um, the bit, uh, if you, you might not be able to see it because it might be behind our faces here, but on the right hand side of the picture is a scratter. Um, you can see the apples being tipped and they're conveyed uh, on a conveyor and sorted. So we've got, a, got somebody who will take out anything uh, that's rotten or, or uh, that shouldn't be there, any leaves or twigs or anything that might have been picked up. Um, and they go through a washer and then milled into this very, well, sort of pea-sized chunks, which is what you see in the hopper there. Uh, and what uh, Mark was talking about earlier, uh, about fermenting on skin, I don't do that um, with any of our uh, ciders, but we do sometimes macerate and we can put a cover over that, that hopper uh, and leave it for sometimes up to 24 hours, which just gives the time uh, we talked about, you talked about the tannins was, gives the time for those to oxidize gently and become brown. What you can see in there, uh, the very dark bit on the sides of the hopper there, that's actually pomace that's been there just that little bit longer. So that browning of the apple is those tannins oxidizing and becoming softer um, with, with that, that time. Uh, and then the whole lot's pumped into the into the press, which is a big wine press. So very gentle pressing um, and very, very uh, efficient press. And that's what it looks like as it's pouring out. So it's beautiful cream, uh, green, 
oh, what am I trying to say? Beautiful brown liquid, amber liquid, there you go, uh, pouring out, um, very pure and absolutely delicious to drink straight from the press. And that what go, is what goes into the tanks to, 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 to make our ciders. So that's, that's a bit of the, the, the early part of, of production. Oh, and there's, there you go, there's the vineyard where the Bacchus is grown. So uh, this is Bishop's Vineyard here on uh, at Ledbury. You can see Ledbury in the distance there and May Hill's just round to the right there and there's some beautiful peri pear trees at the bottom of the vineyard actually. Um, and uh, this is, as I say, obviously goes into our, our wine, but this, the, um, the, that yeast that's, that's left over uh, just traps so much of that sort of elderflower, uh, basil -y character that, that you get with, with, uh, with the Bacchus. I, I must admit, smelling it after it's been in the glass for a few minutes, that elderflower absolutely comes up. Doesn't it? Um, it's and it's it's a, it's a delicious combination. It, it's a very facil a felicitous combination, I think. And I think if, um, I'll so can, I, can I um, yeah. could I just uh, add in there? Um, if if champagne is next to uh, Abel, then if you love Sauvignon, that's what uh, I this to me always kind of sc screams of that kind of aromatics and uh, 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 and flavour. Uh, of uh, of Sauvignon. If you love Sauvignon, then I think you'd really enjoy that. And if you love Bacchus, well, yeah. and if you love Bacchus, Bacchus but Bacchus, Bacchus is, is, is really making its own its own statement now in in Britain since last four or five years, especially with the kind of industries we're having all over the country at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And do you do you um, ferment the uh, just using the Bacchus yeast, or do you add other yeasts? For this one, no, it was entirely the Bacchus. I mean, it was the, the yeast was actually um, a, a champagne yeast that we used initially for the for the um, for the wine, um, but it had taken up all this character, as I as I said. Um, so, but yeah, champagne yeast for the Bacchus. So whatever's left over, it'll it'll revitalize itself with some new sugar coming in, uh, and start again onto onto the apples. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so. Um, I'm going to just give you a little quick run down the, down the side room here. There you go. There's, some, there's our, one of our trial riddling racks there. So some of the champagne method ciders and, and wines that we've got there. Um, so we do quite a lot of um, wild ferment here now. Um, so we've got these big 23,000 litre tanks, um, uh, which is a wild one. But that, that, we've got one here, which is... Um, I don't know, come up and up there. Can you see? Slightly wonky. Uh, so this is a cabinet made with. Um, know, can you see the colour of that? Yeah. This, this is this is a champagne yeast. Uh, we keep it with the yeast in there for for a fair while. This is actually only just finishing ferment, to be honest. Uh, the cider takes a long time to to go through. It's in, in sort of low low nutrient, so we're often still fermenting through to sort of April time. Um, but in the past few years, so winemakers like to have a lot of control in the olden days, <laughs> as in the last couple of decades. So, you know, that's why the rise of, of cultured yeast and, and all the different characteristics that you can get from all the different sorts of, of yeast have become very popular. Um, and as a cider maker, I had to learn to relax um, over the last, you know, 10 years or so. Um, and it's with other producers in the area, Tom Oliver being one of them, uh, who's a fantastic wild ferment cider maker. Um, so it's giving me the impetus and the confidence to do that. And we don't do it on a fairly large scale. Um, so, yeah, we've got these big tanks. I don't know if you can pick up the difference there. Mm. It's a little bit brown. So the whole wild, wild yeast, it's a, it's a whole succession of different yeasts that are naturally on the apple um, from dragon orchards that then take this through a whole stage of, of different fermentations and you get this real sort of different it, 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 the champagne yeast is very clean it, it speaks volumes about the variety and the fruit that comes from from the orchard but with a wild yeast ferment you get these extra layers of complexity and, and, and sort of some funky aromas sometimes it's a little bit of, of gambling involved 
because you never know exactly how it's going to turn out. But I've, I've become much more confident with it in the last two or three years. But are you going to keep using both both types of yeast? It depends on what I want to make at the final product, really. So um, if it's going to go into secondary fermentation um, and, and, you know, and make it into a, a champagne style, then we'll probably use what well, I would use a, a champagne yeast so that we've got that continuity through into secondary fermentation in bottle. Um, but if I'm, if I'm making something that's, um, uh, I want a little bit more interest, so things like our, our Tidna wood cider is a completely wild ferment and, and oak age. And so it's just, just about what sort of characters you want to get out of, out of yeah. the ciders. Yeah. Well, Simon, I think that's fascinating. And I think this is a really interesting cider with so many different flavors uh, from the wine side and the apple side going on. Uh, I think we should go over to Vermont now um uh which now uh, this time of day in vermont is it is it sort of in the middle of the night or the middle of the day let me think you're five hours behind aren't you yes it's, so it's, it's 4 22 <laughs> it's, it's just a nice tea time cider yes uh, exactly time eleanor, to crack it open <laughs> uh eleanor eleanor runs a wonderful operation called eden uh, specialty ciders uh in vermont which is bang up in uh, the top top end of uh, of of new england um now the one one might say was, has cider got much um political or historical or social importance in america well it does um because the the modern america was founded by the people who went over on the mayflower now the mayflower wouldn't have got to america uh, they went through a terrible storm and the mast beam was ripped apart in the storm. And it's only because they had a cider press on board and they managed to take this enormous wooden screw and, and wrap it into the beam that allowed them, the Mayflower, to continue and get to, to America at all. So, um, and within nine days in America, they had already planted uh, apple trees. So... I think it's pretty reasonable to say that that cider is uh, America's original oldest alcoholic drink, and certainly um, by 1775, that's you know a bit later, but just before independence, one farm in ten in New England uh, had a cider mill. Virtually every farm had apple trees, and cider was a sort of currency. You paid the doctor with cider, you paid the, the shoemaker with cider, you paid your children's teacher with cider. And this was, this was greatly abetted by the complete failure of America to establish vineyards. They wanted to establish vineyards. They brought the best possible European vines over, but they were all destroyed by a, a little aphid called the phylloxera aphid, which just et all these American vines. So the apple from the Carolinas right the way up to Maine and, and Vermont, right up on the Canadian border, it, it assumed a, a position of, of, of massive importance in, in American life, not for food, but also for self-sufficiency uh, in drink through cider and through brandy, uh, cider brandy. And it's, it's, it's almost horrifying to see how that amazing tradition completely collapsed in the 20th century and maybe Eleanor you can just take us through how one went from cider being the drink of the nation to it being an almost forgotten activity. Yes and and just to acknowledge first that we don't really know what the first fermented beverage of America was because we really only know the white European history <laughs> that brought it over so I make, I make, <laughs> make that, that clear yeah, sorry <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, um, people talk about how prohibition is what killed cider, um, but really cider was um, on its last gasp by that point because of the whole industrialization of the economy in the uh, 19th century and the move from the country to the cities away from an agrarian lifestyle to a more industrial lifestyle. And um, you couldn't bring your apple trees with you to the city very easily, um, nor, um, you know, nor were they coming over with uh, new waves of immigrants. So, um, so beer really became the, the popular drink of choice um, and, uh, and it was cheap. Um, and so that's, you know, 
died out when prohibition was over. People came back to beer, wine, and spirits, but there was no place for cider in the Alcohol Beverage Act of the Federal Alcohol Act of, of uh, 1933 that reversed prohibition. Um, so uh, it's really only in the past 20 to 30 years that cider has started to have a revival. And um, the, the large part of the revival in terms of dollars and volume came with the introduction of Angry Orchard in 2011 by Boston Beer Company. But the real revival of real cider started happening in the late 1980s when a couple of enterprising growers who were looking at global commodity apple markets and saying, I'm not going to survive this, what was happening, um, I need to figure out something else to do, actually came over to England and some to France and brought Scion wood back um, for those tannic cider apples to figure out, is there going to be, is there a potential for a market for really good cider um, here in the US? Um, and Steve Wood was one of those enterprising growers. He's about an hour and a half down the road from me and uh, a number of his apple varieties and his fruit um, are actually in the cider that we're tasting tonight. Brilliant. So, so, now, are you from a, a cider family or an agricultural family or were you doing something entirely different before this hit you? Oh, I'm, I'm a bit like Andreas. I was doing something more uh, um, uh, theoretical. <laughs> you look as though you're born so I have to say I come from the consumer side of the business. <laughs> yeah, you look as though you were just absolutely born to it, standing in front of that wonderful old barn there. Oh yeah, yep. So, so we started making cider in 2007. Um, we had, had this uh, old farm, and um, it was not a successful. It had been a dairy farm at one point. It really died out. And rather than having it put up for development or just letting the local farmer hay it, we decided, well, let's plant some apple trees. And um, we're very close to the Canadian border and ice cider is something that was developed in Southern Quebec, which is literally, I can see it from my cidery. <laughs> um, and we the thought, Canadian why don't we try and do that? Uh, just pardon? Newport. Is that the Canadian border? Where... Yes, that yeah. dotted line at the top is the Canadian border. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, so we, um, we started making ice cider. Uh, we were the first in the US to have a federally approved label for ice cider. Um, and, um, and then in 2011, as cider became a thing and we realized we had relationships with all these wonderful small scale growers that were growing interesting varieties of fruit that we could make some great dry cider as well. Um, and, uh, we continue to be a small producer whose passion is all about supporting small scale, holistically grown fruit, with interesting varieties that's grown on purpose for making cider. And, um, while, while people often refer to cider as the traditional American beverage from the colonial days. Um, you know, my perspective is much more about really learning as much as I can about all the flavors of all the different varieties and um, how they blend together and experimentation with the goal being to create something that's delicious that goes with food. Um, so we, we talk about cider as wine, it's bringing the perspective of wine to a beverage that is uniquely related to apples um, and the flavors of apples and the, where the flavors of apples are better with food than the flavors of grapes. Um, because uh, in many cases, it's true. <laughs> um, here's a picture, this is just our, um, our ice cider operation. So you can see all these containers are actually freezing um, juice that we pressed in the winter. Um, outside and you'll see more of that from Andreas as well. No, that, I think that thing about, um, about cider with food is enormously important. And I just noticed that, that you said for your food pairings that you like things like sushi, which is basically from a non-wine culture, uh, pad thai, which is from a non-wine culture. So many of the things that we eat on a weekly basis and try to put wine with are actually from a non-wine culture. And that's why one looks, especially so much of Southern Asian and Eastern Asian and Southeast Asian food, let alone African food and Middle Eastern food, it doesn't come from a grape wine culture. And cider, with this purer, brighter fruit quality and this lovely acidity which tickles the side of your mouth, it makes fantastic sense with an awful lot of those cultures. 
So, and there are key parts of our own culture where cider is, um, apples are better food pairings. And you think about what you, how you use apples in cooking, right? So applesauce and pork chops, right? Cider goes with pork way better than grapes do, right? Sausages, um, caramel in dessert wines. Like if you're doing, chocolate is a great red wine pairing. Caramel is an amazing ice cider pairing. Mm. I mean, there are things you, that you can just look at and say, ah, I know, I know apples taste good with this. I know cider is going to be good with this. And northeast of uh, the United States, cheeses. Cheeses. You know, yes. to, be, to be honest, cheese is better with cider than wine on the whole. Yes. And we've had hundreds of years of the Europeans and the French particularly saying, but, French, but wine and cheese is it. Well, if you go around the west of yeah, England, not really. <laughs> you won't be hearing them saying that. And I bet you don't hear them saying that in in Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire. Yes, and we have some wonderful uh, cheddar tradition here in Vermont that, um, you know, so hats off to the original. Would you would you like to, do, I, there are three wonderful um, orchards which I know that you work with, Windfall, uh, Jessica Yates uh, uh, and your own. And, and is it true that uh, where the Windfall orchard's called, it's called the Champagne Valley? Cham <laughs> so Champlain, like Samuel Champlain, yep. <laughs> this discoverer, yes, Champlain. It's, it's right on off of Lake Champlain, but it's very, very close to Champlain. You're right. <laughs> and and the kind of varieties that you've got, you've got eleven varieties. By the way, this is the bottle. If anyone hasn't seen it, yes, I would, I would, I would love to ask Anna who wrote the label. Oh, that's what happens when your owner drinks a lot of cider at night and then starts writing labels. That would be me. <laughs> Saren Song, beguiling harvest cider, and about eight lines later, we're still being beguiled by the, the I would say, the rapturous prose style of whichever part of the ownership wrote this label. But it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a lovely label. But one of the things it does say on it is all the different grape varieties. And you've got grape variety, uh, 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 apple varieties. You've got apple varieties here from four different countries, um, from France and Holland uh, and Britain and America itself. Yes. Um, you've got five different dessert varieties. You've got six different um, cider varieties, five of them bittersweet, one of them bitter sharp. Um, and I think it makes a really fabulous, firstly, a fabulously interesting historical statement but also adds a lot of complexity uh to the palette now yeah. did you choose these one by one and do you co-ferment all the apples or do you have the apples each variety fermented separately um the answer to all of that is yes <laughs> ah, <good>. so <laughs> it's some of everything um this this cider was some of the most wonderful fruit that was going into the press. So as, as the fruit came in from the orchards that we work with in our own orchard, we were looking and saying, oh gosh, this, this stuff is just amazing. And we, we, you know, and sort of, you put that special star on the tank as you're pressing it in it's sort of like this, this is gonna be great. So there some, some, I think the Somerset Red Streak, for example, was in um, a 155 gallon stainless steel barrel um, and a couple of the other varieties we fermented together because we had just little amounts of them. Um, and then um, uh, they were, so they were fermented, they're aged, and then this is a blend. So this is, this is down to blending at the end of it um, to put this together. Um, and part of, part of it is we like to have in our portfolio, we have a very um, passionate cider club. We love our cider club members. And um, they are looking for us to deliver them, uh, you know, some interesting, an interesting variety of ciders, not just all dry, not just all sweet. And so we like to always have something in our portfolio that has some tannin and residual sweetness. Um, so this is, you know, and I, I, I guess this is sort of my point and why I wanted to talk about this cider in particular, which is I'm not trying to make a traditional French style cider or a traditional English style cider or you know what American cider would have been in 1650 in Massachusetts uh, in the Bay Colony. Um, I'm basically looking to say, what, what can I put together from amazing fruit to make something delicious um, regardless of the original origin of the fruit? Um, so we, we like to have something that's got tannin with some residual sweetness 
Um, and because it has residual sweetness, it is carbonated as opposed to um, a natural secondary fermentation, which we would not have a way to stop, um, right? It would just go and it would make it dry. So, um, so this is filtered and then carbonated. Um, and, uh, but no, no pasteurization, no preservatives. Um, and um, it is fantastic with something like, um, you know, barbecue pork roast, where you've got that, you know, sweetness, smokiness, um, a little bit of spice, and then this tannin that could stand up to it with a little bit of sweetness to match the, the barbecue. There is a smokiness, isn't there? And there's, there's also something, the, ta the tannins from 11 different uh, apples with different levels of tannin, it's almost got a slightly wood bark kind of kind of uh, quality to the tannin which is fascinating and there is something a little saline about it i noticed some salinity on mark's uh, cider the able cider as well and and that also just adds a lovely extra dimension on on your palate yep, a little well, more volume <laughs> i i have to say if that's how holistic turns out um eleanor i think this is a beautiful cider uh, by the way, I did notice a, a dammy uh, burgundy barrel in that uh, picture that you quickly flashed past, which seemed to have Kingston, uh, Kingston Black in it, uh, which is a fabulous um, uh, um, bitter sharp, isn't it? And there we are, yes. And, and certainly in Britain, Kingston Black was always um, regarded as one of the relatively few varieties which should be made as a vintage single varietal. Um, and is that why you've put it in a burgundy barrel? Yes, absolutely. And I, I know, Simon, you make a, a single variety of Kingston Black, don't you, as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is, it, is a, it is a balanced um, apple in terms of its sugar, acidity, and tannin, so that you can make a single variety that's got some nice balance to it. It can have some weird flavors. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of sort of like furniture polish and beeswax and things that come along with it, but um, uh, it's a it's a balanced cider. Yeah, and it's as a bit of sharp. It's not too. It's it's it goes. It's not too sharp. Little. Yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. Well, I think that's fantastic, and I think it's time to to uh, head. Uh, I think even further north than Vermont. Yes, we're at the forty fifth parallel, which seems very <laughs> far north to me, but. Um, that's nowhere near to where Andreas is. Andreas, the 45th parallel. That's that's like where you, you know, you, you go to work in shorts. <laughs> right. Andreas goes to work. Yeah. Andreas, welcome. Uh, and Andreas uh, makes uh, Brennland uh, cider uh, from so far north in Sweden um, that uh, I'm, I, I'm presuming in the middle of March is still virtually dark all day long. Well, I would like to say yes, but it's not. Ah. Fairly dark, but, uh, but spring is coming on. And of course, uh, being where we are, uh, we get a lot more light in summer. So, so we're also moving towards a, a much longer daytime period, which at the end of June hits 20, 22 hours of the, of the daylight. So, so really dark in December and really light in June, July. Yeah. Now, are you from a cider background? Why did, why did you suddenly decide to go to somewhere where, as far as I can make out, no one has ever made cider before? I'm not sure they've ever even grown apples. Uh, well, no, no, no. Uh, they haven't grown apples and nobody's made serious cider in Sweden uh, for a very long time, uh, up until about eight or ten years ago. Uh, why did I start? Um, I don't know. I, I come from a, a, a background as a musician and songwriter, and I, I, as a consequence, I got into uh, music software and started a business with some friends that grew. Um, and then I got tired of it and jumped ship. And I think that, well, it's, it's a long story of... Uh, of, of why I'm interested in wine, basically. But, but I think um, as cheesy as it's going to sound, winemaking uh, reminds me a lot about playing and, and writing music. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's the, there's a connection there that, that is a mix between craft and art, yeah. which really drew me. 
to it. There have been some great Swedish winemakers uh, in places like France, uh, yeah. but you you may be thinking like a winemaker and like a musician probably, but you headed north, not south. I mean, you... uh, I'm not one for for buying a timeshare in Tuscany, uh, so I um I wanted to stay at home and still make wine and in the village where I lived, which was called Brennland, there was a lot of apples falling to the ground. So I started out in my garage with the thought of making a really simple French or English style cider from garden apples. But uh, of course, for various reasons, one of them being that I didn't know what I was doing, uh, uh, the first cider didn't taste very good. But also because all, you know, all the apples that we grow here in the gardens and commercially are, are all dessert style apples. And so um, I started looking for a style of cider that would fit those apples rather than try to have those apples fit another style. And, and I came up on ice cider and I started experimenting. And then I found a fantastic mentor and, and teacher in Vermont named Eleanor Leger. Aha. She taught me how to make ice cider. Uh, so it's all, it's, all, uh, it's all her doing actually. So uh, you, I noticed you talk about the Quebec standards, and I know that you know Eleanor is is virtually a few miles away from Quebec, at the very northern tip of the United States. Can you can you tell me something about the Quebec standards? What do they mean? Uh, I will, and then Eleanor will correct me if I'm wrong. I might be I might be on on outdated info, but the Quebec standard basically says that. Ice cider has to be made using natural cold to concentrate the juice. There are two methods that are allowed to extract the juice. One is called cryo extraction, and it's where you pick apples that are still on the trees in February, March, Eleanor, April, much like ice wine, basically. And what happens to the apples as they hang on the trees is they, 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 not, they, they freeze, but they mostly desiccate. Uh, and and uh, moisture uh, moisture uh, passes out of the apple, and the remaining liquid is much sweeter, relatively speaking, much sweeter. Now, as far as I understand it, there are very few producers at this point that have full-on orchards where the apples still hang after frost. There are there are a bunch, and I know Eleanor has some stuff in her orchard as well, right? That that is it's sort of leaning towards that. The other method that's- Yeah, yeah Gold, the, Golden Russet and Cortland are the two that will hang on here. Cool. Yeah, because uh, yeah, that's where I want to go too, of course, but long time until we get there. Um, so the other method that's allowed is that you uh, pick the apples in October, uh, you keep them in cold storage and you press at a point where uh, it's cold uh, enough outside to, uh, to freeze the juice in these um, 1000 liter uh, IVC plastic tanks. And so when I started out with dessert apples in Sweden, making trying to make dry cider, that was not very good. Um, when I found ice cider, it was, it was like a divine intervention because, because the, the climate fit ice cider really well and, uh, and um, the apples fit ice cider really well. So you need to concentrate with natural cold, and then an ice cider has to um, start at at least 30 bricks of sweetness. It has to have between eight and 13% alcohol, Eleanor, is that what it is? And it needs to have at least 130 grams of residual sugar. S seven to 13 alcohol. Oh, seven to 13 alcohol, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What are the acids? Well, I don't know if there are rules for the acids, but the acids are, the acids are, are, are typically much, much higher in, in sweet apple wine than, than they are in sweet grape uh, wine. So a standard ice cider from us will run, uh, depending on the model, uh, the claim you're drinking tonight has 13 grams of, res of, of total acidity. And, and I think the 2018 ice cider has 17 to 18 grams. Uh, which compared to a Mosul sweet wine is twice as much. Mm. Well, I think that's what is uh, the genius of ice cider, because yeah. I must admit, I've got a little tired of ice wines. 
um, I've begun to find that that the mixture of acidity and intense sugar and rather similar flavors, I've just got a little bit bored. So when I came across initially the Quebec ones, but now delightedly um, a European um, wine, which I have to say this, this claim is completely different to the Quebec ones that I know. I'm delighted. That I was very different. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think this is an absolute star wine, but I, but um, tell me what about claim. It sounds as though this isn't not, isn't necessarily your normal ice cider. No, I mean, we make two ice ciders that are heavy, heavily concentrated, that has a lot of residual sugar. And then a few years ago, we started identifying um, a number of uh, fermentations that were from the same harvest and the same extraction dates and the same apple varieties. And, and this is a lower sugar material that we fermented that used to go into the, to the ice cider blend. But we started identifying that because they started fermentation at a lower sugar level, they were showing a completely different expression. And so in 2017, we decided to break it out of the, of the main ice cider blend and bottle it on its own uh, to try to find uh, the equivalent of an Auslaser, uh, an ice cider Auslaser. So a lighter sweet wine, basically. Um, and, and, um, and, uh, but it, there's still 90 grams of residual sugar. So this is an ice cider that would not survive the, the, the Appalachian in Quebec. It doesn't have enough uh, residual sugar. But so here's the reasoning behind that. There's no Appalachian in Europe for ice cider. There's a lot of ice cider coming out of Europe right now that would certainly not because of the concentration method be, be considered in Quebec. And so because of that, we decided to break with the Quebec tradition or the Quebec rule book that, of course, we respect deeply uh, because we, we are still making a true ice wine here. And, um, and, it, and it has a valid, uh, you know, it, it has a, 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 a value in its own right. So we, we, we call it an ice cider still, but we would not be allowed to in, in Canada for sure. But that's, that's, yeah. that's what I, I might call the new world uh, state of mind. Yeah, but that's, in the old world. Right? I know it's not the rules. Your new world in the old world. Yep. It's not the rules, but I know that I'm making something special uh, and delicious uh, and individual. Because I think this at 90 grams of sugar with that 12 grams, 13 grams of acidity is a fantastic drink. And uh, although I'd frankly like to just drink it by itself, I'm, I'm sure that this could go with all kinds of those wonderful northern kind of desserts that I know so well from Sweden um, and those wonderful berries like lingons and things which are not terribly sweet uh, and yet they've been or, or if they are if they've got sugar in them the acid levels are sufficiently high and that's exactly what happens here I think it, it's it's exhilarating it's mouth-watering it's very rich but it isn't sweet um, and, and I think that's, uh, um, I don't really care whether it conforms to anything at all, except to the rule of this is a fantastic drink. Uh, and I'm delighted you made it. Yeah. I mean, and I want to say again, I mean, um, Eleanor has been hugely important here. I think um, that although we've deviated from the Quebec style of ice cider uh, at this point, um, and we also work with German Riesling makers from the Rheingau and, and from Mosul, uh, I think Eleanor's ice ciders were already, when I tasted them the first time, uh, much more classic in, 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 in their profile. Um, the tighter and lighter and, and more ethereal than the Quebec ones that are often heavy on residual sugar and heavy on alcohol, and, and they can be great. So I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, disrespecting, but, but Eleanor was making ice cider that was 10% alcohol. And that was really interesting. And, and, and the reason that we now have are privileged enough to work with Marcus Lundian, who is the winemaker at, at Georg Breuer in Rheingau in Riedersheim, is that he was, he was attracted to the fact that we already ran pretty low on alcohol and pretty light for a sweet wine. And that's, that's Eleanor's doing. So, so it's, it's interesting with that line of... of what is heritage? What is legacy? What is heirloom? Yeah. Um, 
it's 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 incredible really to sit here with Eleanor now because uh, yeah it's fantastic and and t talking of what is traditional what is heirloom uh, what's the situation with cider orchards uh, oh. in the north of Sweden do you have any there are none and 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 I think there are quite a few people who would like to have me committed for saying that there can be uh, cider orchards here but we um, we started establishing uh, trial orchards uh, five or six years ago and uh, and they've, they've done well or better than anyone thought for sure uh, and so in 2019 we were um, we were um, granted a very large innovation project from the European Union uh, from the EIP Agri Fund of the European Union uh, to establish another 10 hectares together with other farmers in the north uh, so so you know uh, theoretically the orchards that we have that are even further north. We have a, two small trial orchards, a hundred kilometers north of Umeå. Uh, they're, they're theoretically the, the northernmost uh, cider orchards in the world. And of course, uh, the goal is to build a terroir here. And you don't even know what that terroir is. It's exciting. It's like- we're, Yeah, you know, we're getting a hint of it, but we don't know yet. But it, it, when, when, um, Mark's father-in-law James turned up in New Zealand. They didn't know what the terroir in New Zealand was, uh, and that's been one of the most thrilling things about wine in New Zealand. Was people didn't know, they had to find it out, and so that's wonderful for you to think. I don't know what this terroir is. I mean, Paul yeah, it, knows what his terroir is down in Gloucester. They've been at it for a thousand years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have we have about seventy different varieties spread over one and a half hectares in, in trials now. Uh, so it's crazy. Varieties uh, or are any of them classic varieties? No, they're we they're all Finnish, Russian, old Swedish varieties. Yeah, uh, that are specifically developed for for old. for tough climates. Yeah, well, wow. just I haven't shown people the bottle. Just one more time. This is this is the bottle. I can't even see where where the front and where the back is. Here we are. Ah, um, it's a beautifully elegant bottle um it's an absolutely delicious wine and i must admit all four of the wines today have shown fabulous personality and if anybody is in any doubt at all that these drinks absolutely can if you want to be put on exactly the same table as fine bottles of wine well these four uh, bottles of cider will prove that absolutely standing as they are um now i wonder whether if anybody wants to have some chat some questions uh richard's got that enthusiastic look on his face which <laughs> well, we've got loads, actually, actually, well. like everyone's been buzzing this evening like I, honestly i don't think we've had our chat so so full with questions and and uh just comments generally i think no one can really i think there's no doubt that sort of cider is wine i think we've really shown that this evening with the, the the way that it's made i think the care that you all put into it and you know how much terroir impacts everything i think and you know this the type of apple as well and you know there's so much history there as well behind behind it that i mean i'm definitely new to this as well i, I think it's it's incredible to, to to learn about um a few a few sort of key questions that i've pulled out um so i'm going to start with um a question early on which was from Joanne Holt um, so Joanne's asked if um, if you drink your ciders sort of cold or at room temperature or you know does it does it depend on what sort of cider it is um, I don't know I think I'm probably going to go to um, Andreas you, you called her that you're sort of Jedi master earlier I'm going to go with Eleanor first if that's okay with this yeah. question <laughs> We're talking about temperature for cider. And yeah. I, I think I completely agree with uh, whichever one of my panelists said, uh, or actually maybe it was Susanna <laughs> saying, um, you know, for something like the Abel, a little bit chilled, just like you would a white wine. And mm -hmm. um, for something that has a little more robust tannin, um, you know, maybe not quite as chilled. Um, I, I uh, a good friend of mine who's also in the business, we talk about serving things at castle temperature um, sort of low fifties, maybe. <laughs> so I think what that what that translate to in English? <laughs> what is that like? Yeah. Dungeon temperature. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And um, and do we think? I mean, another question we've got here from from 
gentleman called Adam King. Um, he's asked, he's asked how long, um, you know, once it's been open, how long can, can the sign last? I mean, again, does that, does that depend on, um, you know, let's say once you put, pull the cork, like how long can it be open for? How long can you drink for? And also like, how long, how long can you age things, you know, cider for? Um, I think I'm going to direct this one to, to you, Simon, um, as obviously you've had experience in the wine, you know, and, and cider fields. I think you might have a bit of insight. Well, I, I continue to learn, uh, to be quite honest. I, I think cider, uh, before it's opened, has great ageing potential, generally speaking, uh, particularly if it's um, made with high tannin varieties, such as in our part of the world here in Herefordshire. Um, and often it will benefit from from several years of age, be it in tank, barrel, or in bottle. Um, and it's definitely you know a product that you can lay down, and it will evolve and and improve or change in character. Um, in terms of, of of popping a cork and sticking it in your fridge, well, cider doesn't tend to last very long in our household when you do that. But um, I think actually the interestingly the the, the ice ciders um, do do actually last quite a long time in my, in my experience in the fridge so if you if you pop a cork on a on what you think might be an expensive bottle of, um, of ice cider it will last you a few good meals so um yeah stopper it well if you've got a vacuum van or similar then then that's great or something that puts a bit of co2 on the top um that same same rules as wine really um but uh yeah they, they tend to last pretty well okay and we've heard a lot of talk about acidity this evening uh -huh. um, and tannin as well. And these are two great preserving pillars of ciders. And, and, and this is uh, ample reason to say, A, they last for a long time in the bottle which they're bottled. But B, they also last for more time than wines last. I mean, take the Sautern uh, comparison, if you like, with ice cider. Um, so turn uh, might have a similar sort of sugar level as a as an ice cider, but it has maybe half the level of acidity. So you won't find that it lasts as long in the in the fridge with a cork stopper in as uh, a, a, as an ice cider. Um, and and this also is a, another dimension adds another dimension around food matching as well, which is terrifically important. You know the acidities within these ciders uh, help them marry and align with foods that wine just really struggles with. Southeast Asian food is, is, is you know, being generalist about it, but um, sweet, sour, chili, spice, herbs, you know, uh, you've got all those powerful flavors going on. These ciders, because of the acidity and the tannin structures, match really well with, uh, with those types of foods. Um, so aging and food in one, in, in one answer. <laughs> well, no, I was going to, that's, that, that's actually led me on to another question, Alistair. I think this one comes from David Seal. Um, he's, he's asked sort of, you know, could we each maybe have, each give me your, our, your sort of favourite pairings with each of your ciders, just as sort of a quick, a quick blast. Let's start with you, Mark, and then go Andreas, then, then Eleanor, then Simon. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I have a, a customer commitment at um, in one minute that I didn't realize this was going to bump up against. It's totally my fault. I'm incredibly embarrassed. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. See you again, so Eleanor. Much. Take care. Thanks, Eleanor. Uh, I'll, I'll do Eleanor's uh, food. Yeah, cool. totally capable. <laughs> uh, so to be honest, uh, Richard, I, for, for me, I'd actually just... Um, Right now in New Zealand, it's, uh, it's, it's basically bluff oyster season. And um, tell you what, if people think champagne and oysters goes well, we should try some Abel and oysters. Yeah. It's Absolutely. delicious. Absolutely okay. delicious. So um, that's just a, a very simple cleansing, you know, fresh out of the sea, that salinity that Oz talked about. Um, yeah, no, our, our cider with, with oysters, banging. I'd, I'd agree. Okay. Sounds delicious. Um, Andreas? Okay, so for the claim, I mean, uh, I, I, I'd like to say everything, but uh, that, that would be really stupid. Um, no, we, we actually, part of the reason we broke it out was that we also needed something that was more parable than the full-on ice ciders that are sometimes twice as much residual sugar. But the claim is, is good, good cheese wine, uh, good with classic, like tat tatin, uh, good with foie gras, 
good with creme brulee, but also interesting uh, to drink ice ciders with uh, fried chicken or fried fowl in general. Oh. And plain also works with oysters, but, but, but really well with cooked oysters like Rockefeller. Nice. If you're not too snobby to eat them. <laughs> but so, yeah, so, so because of that high acidity, you, you get a, a semi-sweet wine you know, or, or a demi-sec rather than a completely sweet wine as you taste it. And so, yeah, it goes with everything. <laughs> but no, but I mean, I, I, I drink it myself without a pairing. I drink it as a meditational wine. <laughs> meditational or meditation? Oh, that's <laughs> <obviously, you> know? <laughs> and Simon, how about you? Uh, well, I think I think oysters is a great pairing for ciders generally. Um, I, I'm not particularly uh, the Bacchus one, but I think cider and oysters is. is wonderful pairing generally speaking uh for the for the back of cider i um i quite like it with some creamy f flavors so creamy curries or um or um something like we, we had it with a moroccan tagine that we cooked and it worked perfectly and that was unusual i wasn't expecting that but um that that was that was a really good pairing and, and that's the thing is you just keep trying keep keep experimenting that's what i'm doing all the time um, i love cooking um, I'm delving into Japanese cookery thanks to CiderCon a few weeks ago where we, we saw a Japanese demonstration with cider. Um, so it, th there's a whole plethora of different food matching experiences to be had with cider. And then, I mean, actually, Alistair, you, um, you did actually send me a, a, an image which sort of shows you sort of the pairings haven't you, of cider and pairings? And I'll, and I'll, and I'll make sure everyone... I've said to go to the audience, actually. <laughs> My mistake. Um, yes, no, I mean, we've got a food and cider, cider matching wheel uh, that we've created uh, that we're quite happy to share around. And I'll put it in the chat in a minute. But as far as the Eden Siren song is concerned, um, my, my sort of immediate... Uh, uh, what springs to mind is is a spring roll and a lovely fresh crisp uh, spring roll um, with uh, nice crunchy vegetables and and just a touch of the Chinese spices. Um, that's immediately what springs to mind. But I think there's a whole wide variety of uh, different uh, foods that it can it it, it can pair with. Um, you know, fatty pork, belly pork absolutely fantastic you can be classic or you can be um more adventurous than that um uh, uh, curries i i think uh, lighter curries would uh, would also go really well with the siren song and i think I, what i'm fascinated by is this balance of uh, sweetness acidity tannin um really going on and and then aligning next to uh, more powerful flavors more powerful spices like uh, uh, in, from Indian curries and so, so on. So that, that, that's that's my suggestion. Thank you very much, Alistair. That's great. I think it just shows the, the diversity, isn't it? Then the and you know, I think with so much complexity bet between behind the sort of ciders that you can you know do cider and food matching. I think it definitely makes it worthwhile doing. So I think actually that's that's all we've got time for this evening. Um, I'd like to first of all thank. Um, all of all of you, our guests, for coming here, um, Mark, Andrea, Simon, Alistair. Um, well, obviously, Eden has now, now left us. Um, thank you. You've all been. I mean, it's for me. It's been captivating. It's been it's been really interesting to learn about cider in, in this way. Um, it definitely is a, is a wine. I think that's that's sort of. I think we've established that today. Um, Oz, thank you for hosting as, as usual. You've been wonderful. And thanks to all of our audience for joining us. You've been, uh, I mean, you've obviously had a really good night. I can see everyone. I mean, I'm getting people shouting out, you know, Mark, people are apples of eyes and things like this, you know, people are having a great time. So um, I think the apples are uh, certainly uh, blowing your mind too, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> they are indeed. They are indeed. Um, well, look, if you've enjoyed today's show, we've got um, a couple more things coming up. So we've got uh, a Rueda tasting. Um, and something that's on our the pipeline is, is a, a tasting from New Zealand as well. Um, and I think we're going to be sending you some information um, about the ciders that you've had today, 
Um, you're going to have a special offer as well, I think, from Alistair. He's put something together for anybody um, who, who wants to join, um, who wants to buy any of the ciders or any other ciders um, from Cider is Wine. So thanks, everyone, for having us. Um, well, thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Thanks. Thanks, Alistair. Nice to see you guys. Yeah, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank, Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night.